Hi, I'm Justin. I'm a student at the University of Michigan, and today I'll be talking about the work I did at the IUREU this summer, which was on transition densities of Brownian motions on metric graphs. So just some preliminary, so I'll be defining Brownian motion. So standard Brownian motion is a real valued stochastic process that starts at zero. That's what makes it standard. It has independent increments. So each, in, each increment is an independent random variable. And this increment is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation proportional to the size of the increment. Finally, the function that maps t to bt is almost surely continuous, which means it's continuous except on a measure zero set. Now, Brownian motion has the strong Markov property, and intuitively what this means is that the future values of the Brownian motion only depend on what the present value is, and it does not depend on its history. So here are some examples, some sample paths of Brownian motion in motion. And the transition density of a stochastic process, we can basically think of as the probability that uh, after some time t, the Brownian motion, or the stochastic process, jumps from value x to value y. So here's some simple examples. So first, let's, let's take the metric graph to be r plus, which is just one vertex and one edge with infinite length. Well, in this case, we can define our Brownian motion on it to simply be the absolute value of the standard Brownian motion on r. And to compute the transition density, this would just be the transition density from x to y, plus the transition density from x to minus y. We can do a really similar thing over the unit closed interval, where this time, instead of just cons uh, considering the positive and the negative values, we have to consider values that are kind of like multiples of two. And we can think of it as the Brownian motion like bouncing between uh, the two vertices. So Brownian motion on metric graphs has a crazy connection to the heat kernel. So we can observe that um, this transition density from zero to x is actually a solution to the heat equation. So um, we, can formulate, we can formulate this as the transition density being equivalent to the kernel of the solution to the heat equation with initial condition equal to f. Now with this in mind, we can revisit our previous example on the unit closed interval. So this time, if we're uh, solving for the heat kernel, which I denote as H instead of P, then we actually get the exact same solution that we got from earlier. Now a significant um, thing I've been studying over the summer is infinite metric graphs, or more specifically trees. But this theorem is really nice because it, it doesn't assume anything about the structure of the graph. It could be a tree, it could be whatever, but it's basically saying that if you have an infinite graph, then we have this really nice upper bound on the diagonal of the heat kernel, which is simply just the transition density from x to itself. And we can actually see that this is a really sharp bound, because if we go with the r plus example once again, we actually recover this upper bound. Now on to metric trees. So on, for metric trees, I define the branching function which is simply the number of edges if you take a vertical slice at an exactly distance r from the roots. So here's a simple example where gamma is a binary tree with doubling edge lengths. And in this case, the branching function is just the minimum of 2 to the n, such that r is smaller than 2 to the n. Now, the large time decay of the diagonal of the heat kernel depends on how fast the branching function grows. And intuitively, this makes sense, because if we have this, this tree that's exploding exponentially fast, then the heat kernel is going to decay really, really fast as well. So here's this first theorem, which says that if we have this doubling condition, which means that if we double the radius, then the branching function can only grow by at most some constant c naught. then we got this nice upper and lower bound on the diagonal of the heat kernel. Now, if we don't have this, we got something a little uglier, but there still obviously will be an upper bound. It just, it won't be as easy to get a lower bound. So some next steps would be to obtain some sharper bounds, um, maybe try and gain insight on the heat kernel not restricted to the diagonal, and also apply these methods to studying compact metric graphs. I'd like to give huge thanks to Professor Lewis Fan, who was an amazing mentor through the summer, as well as everyone else in the group, Elena, Daniel, Demetrius, and Johnny, and also IU Bloomington and the NSF for making this research possible. Thanks for listening.